Hi, uh, my name is Adi Binari. I'm founder and CEO of a company called Applied Blockchain. Um, we're a team of engineers and we build blockchain applications. We've been doing this since 2015 and we've been, built a number of high profile NFT marketplaces. Uh, and I'd like to take you through some of the lessons learned and some of the insights we've had from building these. Um, but in general, we're, we're a team of 70 engineers and if you're working on a project uh, on Solana and you need an engineering team or you need a team to help out, uh, please uh, reach out to me. That's, the, uh, that's my Telegram uh, handle there as well. Okay, so with NFTs and, and I think with blockchain in general, we all get into the details, but I want to just step back a little bit um, as to you know, the reason why we're doing this, the reason why we have uh, NFTs the way we do on blockchain. So the thing that blockchain brings to the table is group security, right? group security of the historical record. Uh, and we need that for NFTs because they're records of ownership. Um, and the second thing it brings is liquidity. And that's really important because we talk about marketplaces and we see some really dominant marketplaces. But if you're just going to have an asset that's going to be traded in a single marketplace, you don't need a blockchain. Right? So the fact that we can take assets and move them across between different environments and different marketplaces and also have the asset live beyond the life of the marketplace, that's really quite a key uh, fundamental uh, reason why we have NFTs and why they're successful in the first place. Um, of course, we have the ERC20 token, which started uh, on Ethereum, and then 721, which led to the fungible token. Um, uh, Cyberpunks, which was the, the, the first kind of public NFT. Uh, and then CryptoKitties, which followed with, rather than just having images, uh, an NFT which is generated uh, through the smart contract, through some code to actually generate uh, the NFT itself. Now, after we had those initial NFTs, we started getting the marketplaces. And we've got two, fundamental, two fundamentally different types of marketplaces uh, across the blockchain, so not necessarily uh, on Solana itself. So on Ethereum, we have Nifty Gateway, which represents one side of the spectrum, uh, which is a, uh, an, uh, a custodial uh, marketplace, which means that basically the, the marketplace itself is holding onto the assets while you have the account with them, uh, and when you buy the NFT itself, the keys are sitting with them, the asset is sitting with them, you're just logging in, and they're doing all of this on your behalf. It's a bit like uh, crypto exchanges, which are, which are not decentralized, which are centralized exchanges. Um, the reason why we have this type of marketplace and why they're really successful is user experience. Right? So I assume everybody in this room and everybody in this conference is, uh, you know, is, is a crypto user and knows how to use a wallet. But if you want to go out to the, to the larger community and bring people into this space, it's really, really hard for, for the average person. If you just say to them, go and buy an NFT, uh, it's going to be pretty tricky for them to install a wallet, to understand what they're doing, and so on. Um, and so, a bit like some of the crypto exchanges, the idea is to let people come in and start playing with this stuff, uh, but a little bit at a distance. Of course, as a, as a technical person, you have to think that this comes with huge risk, right? There's obviously the, the, the risk of all the assets that are being held by the exchange, by the keys that are held by the platform, uh, and, and the, 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 the cyber risk of those keys being compromised and stolen, and the, and the assets being stolen. Uh, so this exists, it exists for a user experience reason, uh, but it's, it's, it's probably not the preferred choice in the long run. Um, and then I guess an even more extreme version of that is what we have with uh, NBA Top Shots, for example. Uh, which ru runs on a blockchain which is m not really very decentralized at this point, right? And it kind of runs as, as a wall garden. Um, so it doesn't have the properties of the liquidity that I talked about earlier. Um, and for all intents and purposes, it probably could run on a server, not even on a blockchain at this stage. And, and most people wouldn't notice the difference. And then the other end of the spectrum, uh, on Ethereum, we have OpenSea. Uh, which I'm sure everybody here knows about and, 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 and has used. Um, this is kind of becoming the eBay for NFTs now. Um, and this is uh, completely uh, non-custodial, which means that every user has to install their own wallet, and the NFTs are allocated to the wallet, which sits on their device. The private key is in their hands, and the marketplace, the exchange itself, does not actually hold any assets and doesn't deal directly with any assets, and that takes away a lot of the risk from the, from the marketplace itself. And this is, this is really where we want to get to. Uh, to do that, the users have to use their own wallets. And on Ethereum, obviously, MetaMask is the popular one. Uh, and on Solana, we have, an ex uh, you know, we have the, the, the Solana marketplace, Solana being a, an example. And it works in a, in a similar way to, um, to OpenSea, in that to do anything, 
you can see it says connect wallet to buy. Right? So to do any kind of activity, to send any kind of transaction in, uh, you have to install a wallet. Um, and then you're then taking responsibility and any assets that are issued are issued directly to you, uh, and you and in, within your custody. Okay? You can then use those assets outside of this marketplace. Uh, and in, in the case of Solana, we can obviously choose from the different wallets, and, and Phantom's an example, and we've got uh, a series of wallets which mimic uh, some of the wallets that we have on Ethereum as well. Um, of course, there's the Metaplex project, which, is, which seems to be a fantastic project, um, which allows us to spin up uh, NFT marketplaces that, again, work in the same way. Um, one of the important things is the token standard, and here it's probably worth pointing out some nuances. Um, on Ethereum, we have the 721 uh, because in Ethereum, we don't really have uh, native tokens, right, apart from ETH itself. So everything has to be defined in a smart contract. On Solana, we get SPL tokens. Um, and uh, so these give us the basic asset to deal with. Um, but then we need metadata for the NFT. And the reason why the structure of the NFT metadata is important is so that different marketplaces and wallets can, can consume this metadata and display the NFT correctly. Um, and so we have a, a standard, standard that's emerging or that's emerged uh, for how to describe the metadata. And it typically points, uh, we have a URL which points to a JSON file, which then contains more of the details, such as the location of the media, location of the image or video or NFT itself. Uh, and here's an example of the, of the JSON structure. Um, one important thing that we, that we come across in, these, uh, in some of these projects is the blockchain itself is really just storing an ownership record. Right? And, the media, uh, and the media itself can, of course, be copied. Uh, the media is just digital media that can be replicated. Um, but where does it sit when you buy it? And in most cases, it's hosted either by the marketplace itself or it's hosted on a regular web server somewhere. Uh, and the danger with that is that people think that they're buying this NFT that they will have forever, and as I said at the beginning, lives beyond the life of any marketplace and lives outside of that. But actually, if the server that's hosting your image goes down and you haven't downloaded it, then you, you potentially lost your image. Um, and so we have, uh, we have decentralized file storage solutions such as IPFS, uh, which can be used to distribute and decentralize storage uh, of the media. Right? And, and add some of the resilience to the media itself, to, to the media itself, and not just to the record, which is on the blockchain. Um, a project that I think is, uh, is is interesting in its own right. Uh, I don't know if any of you came across this one. Was a, a project by the artist Damien Hirst. So Damien Hirst is a is a, is a very well known uh, UK modern artist, um, and it's probably one of the top three artists in the U in, in, in the UK. Uh, traditional modern art, well, you can say traditional modern, but regular physical modern art. Um, and he issued this, uh, this, the, the currency project at the end of July. Now, the interesting thing about what he did here, he created 10,000 physical paintings. Right? Now, the paintings look like this. They're colored dots on a bit of paper. Um, but there are 10,000 of these, and they're all unique. Uh, each one has a, a, a phrase on the back of the, of the painting. Uh, which is this phrase here, uh, and, and, and a unique number, and something that looks like uh, Damien Hirst's face on a, on a note. Now, the interesting thing is that he took the physical paintings, put them in a vault, and those paintings sit in the vault, and at the same time issued NFTs, where each NFT represents one of the paintings in the vault. So you buy the NFT, that gives you the right to come back later and claim uh, one of the paintings that's sitting in a vault and have it sent to your home. Uh, the drop happened at the end of July, and um, let's say that before the NFTs, Damien Hirst was selling his paintings in this way. So there was a drop that he did for about 2,000 paintings a few months earlier, which he sold for, I think they were about $3,000 each, and he sold a few thousand of them, and as an artist, he made a lot of money, but after the drop, that was it. What happened here, because these are NFTs, is the next day, the secondary market kicked in. Right? Anybody who bought their NFT could start selling them. And the NFTs was originally sold for $2,000, and within a couple of weeks, they were up to $70,000 on average. Right? So all of the secondary market activity that we all know and love in the NFT space was brought here to, to, to these physical paintings. Um, and for the artist, this is obviously additional revenue. So he, he made the money that he made on the initial physical drop, or the initial drop, uh, the, the primary drop. 
Um, but here now he's got this secondary market, and there's been $70 million worth of sales in a couple of months that have followed, and the marketplace gets 5% of that, and the artist gets a chunk of that. So the artist now has an ongoing revenue stream, a real a substantial revenue stream from the secondary market for these paintings. Um, a few lessons or just things to take away from those and also from other, other common uh, misconceptions that we get. So I talked in this one about the physical paintings, right, which is quite unusual for an NFT. But we get a lot of people come along and they say, right, I've got a, I've got a really valuable, I've got a Picasso, and I want to create an NFT that will go with it that will show the provenance and prove the provenance of the Picasso. So for us, that's complete nonsense, um, because the Picasso can move around and the NFT can move around and they can be completely unrelated and there's no way that one is going to uh, uh, approve the provenance of the other. Right? I could have an NFT that stays in my wallet and, and I've given the painting over to someone else over there and the NFT still says it's with me. So actually just having an NFT that sits alongside a physical asset I think is completely meaningless. Right? Um, but what, we, what, you, what you can do um, and what you should do is lock up one of them so the other can be traded. So only one of the physical or digital can be, is actually liquid at any one point in time. Right? And that's what we did on the Henny project, um, and that's, uh, that's how I think these should be handled. If you know that the physical is locked up somewhere, then the NFT can spin around and be bought and sold. Uh, if the NFT, uh, and this is what happened on the, on the Damien Hurst project, if the NFT uh, is exchanged for the physical, the NFT gets burnt. Right, so then the physical is out there, you can no longer track it because it's not held in the vault anymore. So now the NFT ceases to exist. And actually the, the project did the same thing the other way around. So if after 12 months the NFT, people have got NFTs and they haven't claimed the physical painting, they're going to burn the physical painting. Right? And that's so that only one of them remains in circulation uh, and the NFT will continue to be, to be traded. But the two can't coexist outside of the vault. Okay? Uh, so the physical and digital cannot be liquid at the same time. Uh, and attaching, as I said, an NFT to prove authenticity of a physical item doesn't really uh, work as most people imagine. Um, and also, even just in the digital world, uh, assuming that just because you've got an NFT and it's, it's, it's got a certain name and, and image associated with it, doesn't mean it's real either. Right? So in Ethereum, you can create an ERC-721 token that has the same name and attributes as another ERC721. Each one is technically a unique item, but actually they can both be called the same thing. Right? And, and, and how would you know the difference? So people make assumptions that just because the, the, the token itself is unique, uh, that, that actually uh, that, you, know, you can't find another one with the same attributes, but that's not true. Uh, so you have, to, you have to know who issued it and who signed it and know that that address is correct. Um, and an example of this all going wrong uh, was uh, uh, on Banksy's website. Uh, somebody hacked the website and added a page which had an NFT, of, a Banksy NFT for sale. Uh, and people signed up for this, and somebody paid £244,000 uh, for the NFT. And it was all, it was all nonsense, because it was a fake page, it was a fake NFT, it was nothing to do with Banksy at all. So he got an NFT that said Banksy on it, he'd actually bought it from the official website. And still, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't real. So there's, there's due diligence that has to happen on these NFTs. Uh, and and you know, people can, uh, can be a bit naive and make uh, incorrect assumptions about them. The other thing to be wary of uh, is token bridges. So you know, what starts in Solana can stay in Solana, but when it needs to come off Solana, things can get complicated. Right? And the bridges that we have today uh, you know, they, they, there's a certain level of trust associated with those bridges because they generally tend to burn assets on one side and mint them on the other, and you have to trust that that's done correctly. And then if you're on the, on the, on the second blockchain, where you've got a wrapped version of the original asset, how do you know that it's, a, it's actually like a real, underneath it, the wrapped thing is a wrapped, ver, you know, it's, a, it's, it's the real thing wrapped, right? It could be a fake thing that's wrapped. And it's even harder to trace because you're not on the original blockchain anymore, so you don't even have the original issuance information. Um, so you have to go back and verify this stuff. Right? You have to see the traceability, you have to go to both chains and see uh, that the assets are connected and that the original asset on the original chain is the real one. Um, and in, in Wormhole, which is a, a bridge for Solana, you can see there's, a, there's actually a tool for verifying the origin of an NFT. 
Um, another consideration in NFT marketplaces is payment. So on the far right, we have obviously payment through crypto, uh, and that's obvious and easy. But again, if you want to have more people interact with this and they, they want to, you want to be able to enable fiat payment as well, then it all gets a little bit complicated and you need to enable on-off ramps and you need to know when things are paid before you can let the transaction through and settled and, and not reversed and so on. So there's quite a lot of considerations if you're accepting non-crypto uh, payment. It's not trivial. Um, and stablecoins can help with that. So stablecoins as a circle give you an on-off ramp and then issue uh, the USDC. And you can take that USDC and accept that into your swaps contract before your NFT is issued or sold. In other words, you know that, there's a, a, that, you know that the, the, the money's there and been paid in the same way as you would with crypto. The, smart contract will act as a, the swap contract will act as an escrow and not send the NFT until the payment has received on the blockchain in a way that the blockchain can consume it. So that's a, it's a great uh, feature that we get now with the stable coins as well, uh, and the on-off ramps that are attached to them. Um, another interesting piece is the, is the royalties. This was touched on on the panel I was on earlier. Um, a lot of artists just assume they've read somewhere that with all NFTs, the artist always gets paid. Right? The NFT goes on being sold, as I described in the Damien Hirst project, um, and the artist can still continue to get royalties. In practice, in almost all NFTs, if, even if they implement this, it's voluntary, right? it's optional. So there's an option for uh, the, the buyer, uh, the, the, the swap, to actually pay, make a payout to the artist. It's not actually enforced in most NFTs. And what happens in practice is that the, uh, the marketplaces adopt it and, and implement it in their marketplace. So if you do it on OpenSea, and there's an agreement with OpenSea to, to pay a commission to the artist, they'll honor that. But if it's traded outside of there, uh, then actually, in most cases, it isn't enforced. Um, and uh, I mean, even in the standard, you can see this, this is a standard that's being put forward on Ethereum, and, and it's voluntary. Uh, the reason why, I think the reason why um, these are being made voluntary is because when you've got the asset in your wallet, you might want to move it around and not necessarily as part of a sale. So I might have a number of wallets, I might want to move it around to myself, I might even want to gift it to someone. Um, and that's not a sale, and then the artist shouldn't be getting a commission on that. Uh, there's technical ways around that with a price of zero and just dealing with it, but for some reason it's not been followed uh, in most of the NFT implementations that we've seen. Uh, and of course we have the meeting of NFTs and DeFi, so you've got your artwork now, the artwork has been traded on the blockchain for a while, uh, and, we, and, and the contract can see that the NFT has value, so why not uh, put it up for financing uh, through a DeFi contract that can understand its price uh, on the blockchain uh, and then offer collateral, uh, use, it as, use the NFT as collateral and uh, offer a loan uh, on the basis of that. Um, so that's obviously super exciting and kind of makes a lot of sense on the blockchain and we're seeing uh, more and more of this type of activity. Um, and that was it, those were the main points uh, and learnings that I wanted to present. Uh, so that's the that's Telegram handle. Um, please reach out to me afterwards if you've got any questions. Okay. Awesome. Thanks so much, Adi.